we're going to sing some more and praise to our God. Our lives to be worshiping Him, centered on Him. Let's make our way back. We'll let y'all sing with us. We 
I want you to, to learn here. We've done this before. I want you to become familiar with it. When we approach God, when we turn our lives over to Him, when we trust Him to take us, it's kind of the way we come to Him, okay? I'm going to sing this and then y'all sing it with me. I come to
said? Amen. Maybe may be seated. Throughout history, there's been times that it, the very last words that someone has spoken has been recorded. Oftentimes, we put a lot of emphasis on the last words that perhaps a loved one has said to us. I'll never forget my grandmother when she passed away. Um, I called her Mima, and uh, I was able to visit with her just days before she passed away, and, and her last words to, to me uh, stay with me because she always sort of pronounced my name a weird way. She had a real southern draw to it. I told her, I love you, Mima. Her last words to me that she said was, I love you too, Gary. She always called me Gary. You know, some last words are recorded in history that, you know, we still remember because of Shakespeare. Most of us remember Julius Caesar when he was attacked in 44 B.C. and he was stabbed by some of his supposed friends and shocked to see his dear friend Brutus holding a knife. You remember his 
his famous words, those last words he spoke, you too, Brutus, or in Latin, a tu, Brute. Some words are a little comical, a grammarian by, I mean, this guy spent his life as a grammarian, Dominique Borjars. He died in 1702. But he was conscious of good grammar right up to the end because his last words were, I'm about to, or I am going to die. Either expression is correct. (laughs) Conrad Hilton, who established the chain of hotels around the world, you know, the Hilton Hotel brand, first one built in Dallas in 1925. He's the great grandfather of, you know, Paris and Nikki and While on his deathbed in 1979, he was asked if he had any final words. And this was what was recorded as what he said. Leave the shower curtain on the inside of the tub. (laughs) I read just recently about this opera singer. He was a tenor. His name was Richard Versell. And uh, he had climbed up a ladder for a very special scene... And he sang these words. These were the words of the song. He said, too bad you can only live so long. And he fell off the ladder and died. Didn't know that would be his last words. Too bad you can only live so long. Of course, all of us know the last words of a redneck, right? Hey, y'all, watch this. I like the lady who put her last words on her tombstone. The word said, see, I told y'all I was sick. But then there's some serious last words. I, you know, I have enjoyed reading a lot of history about Dwight Eisenhower. And he not only lived well, he died well. In 1966, in Walter Reed Army Hospital in Washington, his final words were, I've always loved my wife, my children, and my grandchildren. And I've always loved my country. I want to go. God take me. Good words. John Polycarp, who was a disciple of John, was told if he would renounce his Christ it, it, would renounce Christ his life would be spared and his final words Polycarp said 86 years have I served him and he has done me no wrong how can I blaspheme my king and my savior DL Moody the great evangelist his last words were I see earth receding and heaven is opening God is calling me. John Wesley, in his final words, the best of all, God is with us. And Judson Van Deventer is the author of a great song, I Surrender All. And in his final hours, he could be heard whispering the words, all to Jesus, I surrender. And he just grew so weak that when he spoke his final words, All he could muster to say was, I surrender. Good final words. Would you take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, the 23rd chapter. And today we're going to begin a series. I have been preaching through the book of Genesis. And last Sunday we looked at Abraham when he carried Isaac to Mount Moriah, his only son. We looked at a beautiful picture, really, of the cross in that illustration when the Bible says he was going to slay his son, but there was a ram caught in the thicket and became his substitute. We studied that lesson last Sunday. I hope that was a blessing and encouragement to you. But it's a wonderful introduction to a series where we're going to pause in our study in Genesis and we're going to study for the next few weeks the last words of Christ. 
I just shared with you some famous and funny last words. But folks, I think some of the most important words we could study over the next several weeks, leading up to Easter, there's seven Sundays and then Easter. And each Sunday, there's seven sayings from the cross. And we're going to study each one of the seven sayings of Jesus from Calvary's cross over the next few weeks, leading right up to Easter Sunday. There's a lot of truth for us to learn from these these words. And I want you to understand that these are the last words of Jesus from the cross. But they're not his last words. Because <laughs> he's still speaking, amen. And and but but there are some practical things that that we're going that we're going to learn in in our study. In Luke chapter 23, I want us to begin reading with uh, verse 32. Luke 23 and Verse 32. And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And they were come to the place. Now we talked about that place last Sunday. That's an important place. It's called Calvary. The place of the skull. Golgotha. There, it says, they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiments and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save yourself. And a superscription was written over him in the letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. I I want us to go back for just a moment to that verse 34. These are the first of the seven sayings that Jesus spoke as he was dying on Calvary's cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, in order to understand, really, the, the scene in which these words were spoken, the context of, of his death, uh, there's not a lot in the Bible about the act of crucifixion. Uh, by this time, the Romans had so perfected a Persian practice that they had adopted of execution that they had mastered the ability to literally put a man suspended in the air, nailed to a cross in a way that would most effectively prolong his life even in the process of execution. In other words, this was a very slow process. The Romans had perfected the ability to, in, in, to induce the most possible agony for the prisoners who would be crucified. And so there suspended between heaven and earth, dying in agony, Jesus was able to, to muster enough strength. And every time a person who was crucified, because of the ways their knees were bent, they would have to push up in order to give their diaphragm enough air in order to even speak words or to breathe. And it was during those moments that Jesus uttered these words. Crucifixion to us is, you know, we read about it in history and that's the only way we really know about it. And so the only real, you know, the only real explanation or or statement that's made about it is where it just says, when they came to Calvary in verse 33, there they crucified him. That's all it says there. But now to the first century audience, that spoke volumes. They understood exactly what was going on. Because you see, if I were to tell you today, if I were to say, you know, last week in my travels, I saw a train wreck. Well, you would immediately be able to visualize something that, about what I saw. I saw a train. You've all seen trains. Many of you have seen train wrecks. If not in person, you've certainly seen them on TV or in a movie. And you can immediately, the first thing you would envision would be like boxcars, railroad cars. I mean, all of us have seen 
box cars or passenger cars or railroad cars. And then you would probably imagine those having been derailed and laying over on their side and possibly piled up in some kind of mess, you know. In other words, it wouldn't be too difficult for you to imagine a train wreck. But now if I said to somebody in a first century audience, hey, I saw a train wreck, <laughs> if I could speak to a first century audience. But think about it. If, you, if somebody said to a first century audience, I saw a train wreck, they wouldn't have a clue. They really would not understand a whole lot about, you know, even after we described it to them, it would still sort of be a little foggy to, to their understanding what we're talking about, a train wreck. Well, the, you know, we sort of have the same dilemma in trying to understand crucifixion. For them, that was something they saw on a regular basis. To them, that was something easy for them to understand. And that's the reason the Bible doesn't go into a lot of detail. It just simply says, and there they crucified him. The first century audience understood the enormity of that statement. They understood how terrible, excruciating, gruesome, horrible, bloody. And then it says, after Jesus was crucified, then said Jesus in verse 34 then said Jesus you know it's interesting that Jesus even spoke from the cross after all that he had been through and what's even more interesting is that God inspired the writers of our scripture the gospel to record what he said can you imagine if we had no record Everybody would want to know, what did our Messiah say? But we actually have a record. And I believe that these words are recorded for a reason. That God inspired the writers to put down these words that Jesus spoke so that we could learn something not only about his death, but we could learn something about his life and his teaching. I mean, just think about the first three words of that verse. Then said Jesus. Let me just talk about the word then for a moment. He had just been crucified. They had just erected that crucifix, that cross, the thud of it hitting the ground after he had been nailed to it. And now after that, the Bible says then, uh, let's let's stop with the word then for just a moment, and and let's rather than it say and then said Jesus, let's put let's put us there. Then said you. And what would you say if you were being executed for crimes you did not commit? You were totally innocent. If you had gone through the night of torture and suffering that he had been through. If you know that you were if you knew that you were in your final moments of life what would you say There's some first century historians that actually recorded some of the words of people prisoners who had been crucified You have first century historians people like Flavius Josephus and Cornelius Tacitus and some other early historians and they've actually you know what you know what most of the people who were crucified, most of the criminals were crucified. You know what they said? They said profanity. They cursed. They cursed the soldiers that were killing them. They cursed the crowd that was there gathered to observe or to mock or just to witness what was going on. They cursed God. I mean, some of these people who were crucified were where they were, they were legitimate criminals. I mean, they were rogue of society. They were repulsive individuals, and, and, and they expressed themselves. Some people who were crucified were constantly begging to be released, to be set free. Others were continuously proclaiming their innocence. In other words, these soldiers and these crowds who had seen so many crucified... They were totally unprepared for what Jesus said. 
See, they were expecting the same as they had heard from everyone else. But can you imagine the impact of these words on the audience that heard Jesus speak these for the first time? They were stunned. One in the crowd even said, we, you read later in the gospel, never have we heard a man speak like this before. Certainly he must be the son of God. Because they were unprepared. It was like a lightning bolt out of a clear sky when Jesus said, and everybody there waiting to hear these words, Father, forgive them. Forgive them for they know not what they do. Can you imagine the impact that would have had? Then, and the next word is said. Then said Jesus. Did you know the verb said is in the perfect tense? I've studied this passage and I've preached from it before. But you know, God always shows me new things as I prepare and study for sermons and messages. That's the wonderful thing about the truth. It's a living book. It speaks life and it's constantly revealing, God's revealing himself in it. How many of you have ever read the same scripture over and over and over and God show you new things? So that sort of happened in, in, to this week in preparation for this message. God showed me something I had never seen before. It says, then said, for whatever reason, I've studied Greek and I understand a little bit about the Greek vocabulary and semantics and morphology and things that have to do with the Greek language. But I, it, it, it just occurred to me this week that that word is in the perfect tense. You know what that means? That means that it has continuous action. Some of the verbs are aorist tense, some are imperfect, some have punctiliar action. But the perfect tense of a verb in the Greek language is continue, it implies continuous action. In other words, this statement, yes, it was one of the last seven of the statements that Jesus spoke, but this statement he repeated. He, he, he repeated, Father, forgive them. You, you, you can't help but imagine that because the writer of the, the Bible was inspired to record it just this way, that we were to be reminded that in every aspect of the crucifixion of Christ, he was praying for those, Gee, God, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Maybe whenever they were scourging him, he was saying that, Father, forgive them. Maybe when they plucked the beard from his face, he was saying that, Father, forgive them. Maybe when they put the crown of thorns upon his head, Father, forgive them. When they spat at him and when they mocked and ridiculed him, Jesus was continuously saying, Father, forgive them. When they nailed his hands, Father, forgive them. When they nailed his feet, Father, forgive them. When they lifted him up, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Then said Jesus. And that little phrase, for they know not what they do. Well, they knew. I, I, think, I think for the most part they knew. Well, they knew they were crucifying a man. But, but I think they probably even knew that they were crucifying an innocent man. Because they had heard Pilate say, I find no fault in him. They knew they were crucified. And I think what they didn't know was that they were taking the earthly life of the Messiah. I think they did not really understand or appreciate the full context of the fact that they were killing the Son of God. They, they knew they were killing a man. They knew they were killing an innocent man. But I don't think they understood that they were killing the Son of God. So Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Well, I don't have much time, but let me just highlight three or four things that I think we learn from this. First of all, we learn a word about prayer. You know, Jesus, in one of the most trying times of his earthly life, he prayed. 
It, this was natural for Jesus because he always prayed. I mean, often and throughout the ministry and life of Jesus, you read where he would go off away from the crowd to pray. Prayer was a natural part of his life in good times, so it was easy for him to pray in bad times. You, let me, this is a lesson for all of us, folks. You know how sometimes whenever we hear of a bad, of a bad diagnosis or we hear of somebody that's been injured or we're going through a tough time or we have financial you know, we're in a critical state financially or physically, or we have a loved one who is dying or sick. Have you ever noticed whenever there's a crisis or some kind of tragedy that comes into our life, all of a sudden we get really serious about prayer? And we should. The Bible says, cast all of your care upon him for he cares for you. And I believe in the power of prayer. I believe we have not because we ask not. But folks, I want to tell you, it is so much easier and it is so much more of a blessing whenever you're not a stranger to prayer when those times of crises come. If that's something that you've been practicing all in your life and your walk with the Lord. It, you know, it's great whenever you go to God in time of a crisis and you don't have to spend the first few minutes introducing yourself. You know what I'm saying? Jesus prayed because that was just a natural part of what he was already doing. He already was a man of prayer. And so I think we learn a, a, a lesson of, of, of prayer. But we also learn a lesson that nobody is beyond the reach of prayer. When you think about the audience that Jesus was praying for, no one is beyond the, the, I mean, I've talked with people who thought they were too bad for God to save. I've had conversations with people who basically were saying to me, I don't think God has saved me because of all the bad things I've done. Let me tell you something, God can save anybody. And nobody has done anything so bad as actually nailing his hands to the cross and his feet to the cross. Nobody has done anything as bad as literally being the ones who crucified him. Yet it's those very ones that Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. And if God can forgive them, he can forgive you. There's nobody in this room that's too bad for God to save. Isn't that good? I tell you something else. There's nobody in this room that's too good, so good that you don't need to be saved. <laughs> All of us need to be saved. And whenever Jesus said, Father, forgive them, I believe by implication he was not only talking about those that were there immediately, those present who were actually crucifying him, but I believe by implication it extends to all of us because you know what the truth is? All of us were there. Every one of us <coughs> shared the responsibility of the death of Jesus because he died for your sins and my sins. You know, we used to sing that song, Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? I was there, you were there. I'll never forget the story I heard about R.G. Lee, one of my favorite preachers. R.G. Lee passed away many years ago. He was a prince of preachers. He had a way with words. He was just an incredible godly man and he preached. He signed my Bible. I've got it right here in this old Bible that I so wore out. But he signed my Bible on the, the 60, he had been preaching 66 years and on the anniversary of his 66th year preaching, I was able to go here and preach. And he signed, prayed with me and signed my Bible that night. He's the preacher. If you've never heard the sermon, Payday Someday, it's a great, great sermon. Dr. R.G. Lee. I'll never forget a story I heard about the first time he took a tour group to Israel. It was the first time he had been. And... The story is that Dr. Lee ran ahead of the rest of the group and whenever they came to that rocky hillside outside of the walls of Jerusalem, Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, literally even today there's a rock cliff that sort of stunningly looks like the face of a skull. You have to stand back and, and sort of, is, I mean, is they, you know, it's not, they got a bus station underneath that, that stony outcrop now, but when you stand back and look at it, you can still see many people believe 
you can see the face of the skull there and just the crevice of the rock. There's a place where you can see an eyes and a protruding rock as a nose. And I mean, it's, it's, it's hauntingly similar. And many people believe that that's Calvary, that that's Golgotha where Jesus was crucified. And the first time Dr. Lee went there, he ran up that hill and went ahead of the rest of the group. And, and whenever the rest of the group got there, he was just kneeling there at the top of that, that hillside. And the tour guide came up to Dr. Lee and put his hand on his shoulder. And he said, Dr. Lee, he said, have you been here before? And R.G. Lee said, oh, yes. Yeah, I've been here before. 2,000 years ago, I was here. I was on the heart and mind of Jesus when he died. See, I think that prayer extends to all of us. Father, forgive them. Not only is it a word of prayer, it's a word of proof. And for the sake of time, Dustin, I want you to put on the screen Isaiah 53 and just verse 12. I had other verses. The context of Isaiah 53 is it's a prophecy about the crucifixion of Jesus. And I want you to see that to the very letter, Jesus fulfilled this prophecy. He said in Isaiah 53 verse 12, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he will divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This was prophesied about 750 years before Jesus was actually crucified. And it said about the crucifixion of the Messiah that he would make intercession for the transgressor. Prophecy was fulfilled when Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It was the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And it also proved the validity and integrity of his life because he practiced at death what he practiced at, in life. But not only do I see in this words, Father, forgive them, a word of prayer, a word of proof, but also see a word of pity because, and I say pity in the sense of it was a merciful word. Jesus was not thinking about himself. He was thinking about others. You know how easy it is when we get offended or, you know, we always, we have a tendency to be so self-centered. But all throughout the life of our Lord, he was always thinking of us. He was always thinking of others. You remember Samson, you know, whenever he died, um, you know, he, his prayer was, if you remember, he, were, he was pulling down the pillars of the temple where the Philistines were. And it was like his attitude was, Lord, I'm about to die, but let me take some Philistines with me. I mean, you know, it was all about getting even. But Jesus, you know, his attitude was never get revenge, never get even. That's coming later. We're reading about that in Revelation. <laughs> but during his life and now in the age of grace and mercy, sometimes when we feel like we've been offended, you know, we have to get, we have to get even. And we do it in little hateful, innuendo ways with remarks and cutting comments. But I want to tell you, whenever you have an unforgiving, grudge, bitterness, vengeful attitudes towards others who have mistreated you, you're never more unlike Christ. Because the Spirit of Christ is, Father, forgive them. But I just want to close with this truth from this passage. This passage used to sort of, uh, I used to struggle a little bit with it. Because I always wondered, does God just, did he just arbitrarily forgive those people that were literally there in the first century that actually crucified Christ I mean certainly God answers the prayer of Jesus but the rest of the Bible teaches something about repentance faith relationship for salvation and and so 
I used to struggle a little bit with, well, when God said, when Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It took me a little while to understand exactly what that prayer was about and what, what he was saying because I know God answered that prayer, but I also know the Bible teaches that the people who are forgiven, the people who are recipients of grace, there's also an element of faith that's incumbent upon them as well as repentance and awareness of sin. So what is it that was meant when Jesus said, Father, forgive them? Well, I think the Lord showed me the answer. I believe what God, what Jesus was saying when he prayed that prayer is, Lord, do not hold this sin of them putting my physical life to death. Do not hold this charge against their account. Lord, forgive them of this act. And I believe the implication is when they come to you in faith and in repentance, forgive them of this. Don't hold this sin against their charge. Did those people come to faith? Did they hear the gospel? Did they respond to the gospel? I want you to look in closing to Acts chapter 2, and I'm going to close with this, but I want you to see this. I want you to look in Acts chapter 2 and verse 22. These, this is just days after the crucifixion. The same crowds, the same soldiers, the same people that were present at the crucifixion of Jesus were present at this occasion, I believe, because it was in the same location. All of this happened in the city of Jerusalem. And look in Acts chapter 2 and verse 22. Simon Peter is preaching. This is the day of Pentecost. And he says, you men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, signs which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands. You, you have taken and you have crucified and put to death. I believe that God so arranged the affairs of those people that were involved in the crucifixion of Jesus to be present at the time Peter preached this message. The implication is certainly there because Jesus, Peter very specifically said, you crucified him, you put him to death. That same one, this is, you did this. But the story doesn't end there. Go to verse 36 and listen. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He preached the gospel. He said, now when they heard this, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? There's conviction. That's faith. What shall we do? We're convicted of our sin. And I want you to look in verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, for you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know what? I believe that God arranged for all those people to hear the gospel message that Peter preached. And the Holy Spirit convicted their heart and their life, and they came to God in repentance. And I believe God forgave them, saved them. The Bible says it was that day 3,000 were added to the church. It wasn't because, listen, it wasn't 3,000 people got saved. That's who responded to the invitation. It wasn't because Peter preached a great message. I want to tell you the reason folks got saved that day, the reason some of those people that crucified Jesus that day, the reason some of the people that were in the crowd that mocked and ridiculed him on the cross, the reason that most of all of them got saved that day was because God prayed, the Lord Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. God honored that prayer. Isn't that wonderful? And he'll do the same for you. 
We won't turn there, but Dustin, if you could put John 17 on the screen. Jesus is praying for you. I think I gave you uh, John 17 and verse 20. Same prayer that Jesus prayed for them. This is the words of Jesus. In your Bibles, this would be written in red. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. He said, I'm not just praying for those in my generation, but I'm praying for all of you. Jesus is praying for you. Listen, if you've never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, he is praying for you today. He's praying for you. You're hearing the same gospel that they heard in Acts chapter 2. You can come to him in repentance and faith, and he will forgive you, and he will save you today. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this word from your word. And I pray, Lord, that if there's some here this morning that need to give their heart to Christ, I'm praying for them. There's been others through the years that have prayed for them. May this be the day of their salvation. May they come to give their heart to Christ, to follow you in believers' baptism. Lord, whatever decisions need to be made, I pray your will be done. We ask you to bless this invitation in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together. I'll be here at the front to receive you. Let's sing together. You come right now. God has spoken to your heart. Share that. Oh, to Jesus, I surrender. surrender all you'll never ever regret giving your life to Christ let's sit together for a moment and uh, I'm going to ask our men to come to receive our offering and let's pray and ask God to bless bless our offering father we ask now as we worship you through the giving of our tithes and offerings that you would multiply these gifts use them to impact people's lives in this community and literally throughout the world through the ministry of our church lord I thank you so much for the faithfulness of the people of this church Lord, I thank you for people who, who understand that the tithe is holy unto the Lord and just faithfully week after week, month after month, support the ministry of this church in obedience to your word, but not just in obedience, but in gratitude to your blessings. And Father, I pray that you'd bless them. I pray that you'd bless their homes, their health, their families. I pray that you'd bless their jobs, their vocations. I pray that you'd bless whatever means of, of income that they have. Lord, I just pray that you would show your favor to them. And I ask, Lord, that you would reward their faithfulness and take what they give and not only multiply it to touch people's lives through the ministry of our church. But Lord, I pray that you would multiply it a hundredfold and return it back to them in the years to come that they might continue to be stewards of your resources. I ask you to bless this offering as we worship you in Christ's name. Amen.